Beste luisteraars, welkom bij de podcast over digitale toegankelijkheid bij de overheid. Behalve deze proloog is de podcast vandaag in zijn geheel in het Engels. Dit vanwege de Engelstalige gast. Luister je liever niet naar een Engelstalige aflevering? Dan kan ik je verwijzen naar een van de andere afleveringen in de feed. Die zijn in het Nederlands. Wil je dit wel luisteren? Dan wens ik je veel luisterplezier. Dear listeners, welcome to the podcast of Gebruik Centraal, also known as User Needs First and Digi Toegankelijk. A podcast about how the government can put humans at the center of its services. This series is about digital accessibility in government. My name is Randy Semeleer. Today, the episode, a conversation with Derek Featherstone. We'll talk about Derek's views on the current state of digital accessibilities, his drives, and perhaps he'll even share a tip or two. My guest today, as you might have guessed, is Derek Featherstone. Derek is a sought-after speaker when it comes to topics related to accessibility. Though, in the early days, it didn't seem like it would come to this. Since his early teens, Derek wanted to be a teacher. He taught biology and chemistry for a number of years. Then, in 1999, he shifted his career towards the path he is still currently on, you could say. He founded the company Simply Accessible, a company specialized in a people-first approach when it comes to teaching the art of accessibility, as they put it. The company was acquired by Level Access in 2018, and now Derek is their CXO, the Chief Experience Officer, a position I personally would like to see more often among the execs. Besides all this, Derek is also a dad and a Canadian. Welcome, Derek. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Awesome, awesome for you to join us. So, Derek, uh, I want to start off with a little bit of trivia. There's this company called uh, Usable Net, and they did an analysis, and they are projecting that for 2021 there will be a rise of 20% regarding web accessibility lawsuits compared to 2020 in the US. Uh, that is. So, when you hear uh, a rise of uh, percentage in, in uh, web accessibility lawsuits, in your opinion? How important it is to actually have uh, legislation regarding web accessibility? Oh, wow. Great question to, to start off. I think, uh, th- unfortunately, as, as much as I wish it wasn't true, we still need to have that, that legislative side of things in, in the accessibility world. Uh, mm-hmm. Not because... Not because it's the only way that people take action, but it needs to be there to protect the the rights of people with disabilities. Uh, because mm-hmm. I think what a lot of what a lot of organizations have shown over the last year, and, and when I say over the last year, over the last several years, many many years, when I say organizations, I don't just mean companies. I mean governments, companies, any level of organization, mm-hmm. sometimes they need, they need that reminder that they're, they need to create things that are for everyone. Yes. And people with disabilities are often left out. And so the, the legal side of it is there as a, a necessary reminder, as a necessary motivator. Uh, even though I envision and hope for a world where people of all kinds create things that are accessible for people with all different types of disabilities, it takes a while to get there. And and we want everybody to do it for the right reasons because it's the right thing to do. But often we need that, that legislation there as a, as a reminder, as a motivator, as, as something to get the conversation started. Um, Mm -hmm. So it, it has an important role to play, uh, and and will probably always be there. You think so? Always. I, I think they're they're they're. I mean, I can't look too far into the future, but I think for sure. the the future that I foresee, there will always need to be some sort of legal protection for people with disabilities, just like we have protection for people. Um, you know, that are often excluded for other reasons, whether it's, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's, whether it's, it's race or language or age or, or whatever it is, disability is, is one of those things that, that needs to be 
needs to be protected in a way because if we don't have that, some organizations just won't care and they won't they won't create things that are for everyone. So and unfortunately, I think there is just this future where there will always be some legal protections that need to be there because there will always be someone that doesn't know that they that they need to act on this, that they need to make sure that the things that they're creating are for everyone. Yeah. It's interesting because if you think about it, a lot of uh, countries, at least, uh, um, maybe we should, no, well, maybe we shouldn't, I'm not sure, but a lot of countries, at least in the West, have a constitution that um, uh, forbids any discrimination. And a lot of th- uh, countries explicitly also include people with disability in that. Still, there is uh, a need for extra legislation when it comes to uh, making sure that digital means are accessible for those people. Yeah, and I think it's I think that is partly due to just the way that most most jurisdictions whether they be, you know, countries or or you know, parts of countries, states, provinces, whatever. There's the legislation that sets like the the high the high level concept, right? We mm-hmm. in our constitution here in Canada you know, we have our, our Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms, and and people with disabilities uh, are, are included as part of that. Mm-hmm. But that is such a high-level document and such a high-level concept that putting it into practice needs some of those other aspects that, that legislation and regulation bring. Um, yeah. and, and so that's like, how do we put this into practice? What does this mean? How will we enact this? Uh, in in the country of Canada, for example, so you have we we recently created the Accessible Canada Act here in in Canada, and okay. that's uh, you know a few a couple of years old now, but we're still going through the process of figuring out how will the country govern over this, right? What are the what are the rules? What are the regulations? How will this be implemented? What are the the timelines for implementing it? So even if we say at a, at a high level, the Accessible Canada Act exists. It's not something that immediately, you know, there's there's all the systems in place that we need in order to to make that a reality within within the country. So there's there's kind of different levels of of the legislation or the legal the legal mandate that that help make sure that people with disabilities are 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 and that their rights are protected yeah so supplemental legislation and regulation is definitely needed to to help protect those rights definitely okay okay F- thanks there for that so i wanted to get uh, into your uh, past and your motivations a little bit you made a switch from teaching uh, towards your current career path what made you make uh, that switch? A, there's a few things that that go into that, and I like to think of it as this, this you know these great coincidences that that all happened at the same time. Um, I was I was teaching, and in 1999, I I was teaching high school, uh, as you said, biology, chemistry. I was teaching computers as well, mm-hmm. um, and. I actually got sick at, at one point, and my my grandmother had passed away. And three mornings later, I woke up, and the left side of my face was paralyzed. Oh. Um, and that was that that shook me to a to a certain extent. It made me question a, a whole lot of things. My Can first imagine. reaction my first reaction was, "Oh, I've had a stroke." Um, what does that What does that mean? Turns out, it, it wasn't a stroke. Uh, it was something that was probably a little bit related to stress and and some kind of a viral infection or something like that, just based on everything that was happening at yes. the time in my life. And uh, you know, with my grandmother passing away, that was sort of the 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 last straw, so to speak. And 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 it, I was off work, I think, for about three months. And during that wow. time, I you know I I recovered. Uh, but there was there was a whole lot of things that 
I think made me kind of rethink where, where am I going in my career? What am I doing? Um, and, and so a lot of things just happened all at once. I was building websites, uh, from the mid 1990s when I was in university, uh, mm-hmm. and I was building web-based resources, you know, the web was still new, relatively new and, and it was pretty cool. Everybody wanted to, to be doing things there. So I had sure. some exposure to, to doing things on the web and, in the process, I would say in about 1996 or 97, I was actually building websites for my students so that they had online resources available. Up, up until then, everything was either in a book or it was something that I would create as a, you know, as a, as a handout and I would give them a paper copy. Uh, and it just seemed to me that since most of the students that I was working with at the time were really into and getting connected to the internet, Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. made sense to put, you know, to put extra resources out there so that I could use that as one of the, the, the teaching tools that I had. So that, that led me to discover a whole bunch of different things about web standards and the way that, that the web worked in, in different browsers. I was upset and frustrated that my, the web pages that I had built looked fine in Internet Explorer 3, but they did not render at all in Netscape Navigator 3. Yeah, the infamous uh, browser wars uh, back then. It, it, exactly. And so that led me to to kind of investigate, like, you know, what what is web standards? How does this all work? That led me to accessibility as well and, and led me to all kinds of uh, Usenet news groups that, that included accessibility as part of the discussion. And it was, uh, you know, very much a thing that I was interested in. And it also resonated with me because I very much believed as a teacher that the things that I were teaching were for everybody, for every student, regardless of, uh, and I wasn't necessarily thinking about disability at the time. I was more thinking about this message is for everyone based on their learning styles so mm-hmm. I was I was teaching science concepts that I thought were really important to 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 young students so that they could become smart, engaged citizens down the road. Uh, but I was also teaching people that were very arts oriented and did not did not necessarily love science. And so I was trying to find sure. ways to connect, you know, to to connect to each one of those students. And so we did fun things like I would. I would ask students to write some poetry or or act out a science concept so that it it found some way of of resonating with them. Mm-hmm. So that concept of this content, this message is for everyone, regardless of anything, was always something that was on my mind. So when I first came across accessibility and the concept that this content, the things that I am creating are for everyone including people with disabilities. It just, it really, that really clicked for me. Um, so when we take all of that together with my, you know, my kind of questioning where I was uh, in my yes. in my career, my grandfather had a stroke in the mid 1980s. And so I, I lived with my grandparents for, you know, for, for several summers and, and, you know, I saw the the barriers that my grandfather faced after after he had recovered from his stroke. He wasn't ever able to use his left hand again. He walked with a with a cane. He had balance related issues. He wasn't able to mm-hmm. to bend his left knee. So all of these things all come together, and it becomes pretty clear to me that after teaching, or I decided that I wanted to leave teaching, I was going to continue to teach people about web design and web development, and accessibility was going to be part of that. Yes. And that that is what kicked off uh, you know, my career in, in accessibility to the point where in about 2002, 2003, all the way through to 2005, accessibility became just a bigger part of of what I was trying to do in, in my, in my work and with our, with our small company. So I eventually got to the point where I decided accessibility was effectively the only thing that I wanted to do. And the only thing that I wanted us to do as a, as a company. So that's, that's the genesis of, of the, the very short version of how 
I got to where I am. I know that doesn't seem like a short story, but that is definitely the short <laughs> version. I can imagine that it's quite a process that's going to take uh, yeah, years even to mm -hmm. uh, discover where you want to go and where you want to take uh, your career next. Uh, so it is quite personal for you, it sounds like. It is, it is. Um, and, and people, I, I will say this and acknowledge this, I, I was born with a club foot. It is considered a disability, but... Um, I, I honestly say to people too, they, you know, most people, they can't see my club foot. They don't, they assume that I don't have any disabilities. Um, uh, I, I would say I do, but I don't have a disability that has a severe or significant impact on how I'm able to use, you know, use the computer, use websites. Mm -hmm. Although as I am getting older, I find that uh, my, you know, my, my left leg is not as strong as the right one. And that's been that way for my entire life. It's not mm -hmm. as flexible. So I am not able to sit or stand for as long as I used to be able to, I need to, I need to walk around a lot. If I'm standing a lot, I need to make sure that I'm sitting, that I sit down. If I'm sitting down a lot, I need to make sure that I stand up and, and move around. And okay. that's, that's more because if I don't, my leg starts to starts to hurt quite a bit and you know not a you know not a 10 out of 10 on a pain scale more like a you know a three or a four but i find that, that 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 actually gets me to a point where if i don't keep moving around and changing my position it actually starts to to work through my knee and my hip and my back and my shoulders and that means that if i'm sitting here for you know for two hours I probably need to move around because I'm going to be in, you know, I'll start to be in pain in my, in my, in my back. Now I will also say that could be just because I'm getting older, mm -hmm. right? That, that may or may not be directly related to, um, you know, to my, to my club foot. I have no way of knowing though. I can't AB test it to, to be able to, to be sure. I have only one body, of course. Exactly. Okay, so uh, yeah, it does sound uh, quite personal. Thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, you uh, spoke a little bit about at a certain point you wanted to focus more or solely on accessibility. Um, can you tell a little bit more about uh, what went about that? Uh, uh, what made you think that this is the, the thing I'm, I'm about websites, I want to create uh, uh, web solutions uh, uh, in a certain point of your career and at a certain point you thought let's only focus or let's highly focus on that digital accessibility part um, can you uh, go into that a little bit more yes I I think I was at a point where I really saw that the entire web industry was not putting enough focus on it and and you know for me as a as a teacher as a you know I, I wanted to be a teacher since I was around 12 years old I, I wanted to teach I wanted I wanted to coach people I, I really enjoy that aspect of doing things it's very self uh, you know really fulfilling for me to to be able to teach people and to share things with them mm -hmm. and and I saw at that point you know I, I would say even in 2000. 2004, 2005, there weren't that many people that were, were talking about accessibility or teaching people about accessibility. Yeah, really and, early days back then. Yeah, and, and so that was a thing that I saw, you know, A, I saw it as an opportunity, but at B, I also saw it as something that was really, you know, would be really uh, just, you know, fulfilling for me to do as, as, a, as a career and and having developed a certain amount of expertise in it and seeing that that people started coming to me and asking for for consulting advice or for help yeah. with the hands on like how do we don't know how to take this app and build it in a way that means it's accessible and and that mm -hmm. to me was like this is and i i love that challenge i also love the challenge especially back in those days of people saying, well, we can't make that accessible, right? That's impossible to make accessible. 
Mm-hmm. As soon as somebody tells me that something is impossible like that, that makes me want to do it just that much more. Uh, so I was, I was really just quite excited about that, uh, about having a niche that I could, that I could focus on, that I had developed some skill and, and, and massive interest in. And for me, it was just a thing where I looked at it and said, this, I mean, it feels right. I was at that point too, in 2005, I started getting invitations to speak at, at conferences internationally, uh, yes. all over the world. And that to me was, was kind of a, you know, signaling to me that, that I've got some expertise here. I should definitely start moving in that direction because it, you know, for every, for every hundred people that would be out there and speaking at conferences about web development and, and writing code, whether it was HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, or, or, you know, these days React or whatever it is, for every hundred of those people, mm-hmm. there was like mm-hmm. one person that was talking about accessibility. And, yeah. and so I, I just wanted to really get out there and, and teach as many people as I could and, and help, uh, you know, help the industry get better at delivering on the promise of making these digital resources available to everyone and accessible to everyone. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like that teaching is still uh, uh, an important part. Being a teacher is still an important part of who you are, even if you uh, switch to professions. Every day, Um, every day. It's, it's what I love the most. Well, great that you can still practice it then in uh, in this way, um, and of course beneficial for a lot of people that uh, want to learn about that uh, accessibility uh, topic. So, Derek, you, um, if we talk about digital accessibility and inclusive design, these two topics, they you could say they relate and overlap. Maybe they also differ. How do you think they either relate, overlap, or differ? So, I look at accessibility as an outcome. It's a, it, it's a measure of how, how someone can or cannot use, the, and, and I'm thinking digital accessibility here, not broader sure. like physical built environment accessibility, but, but accessibility is, is an outcome that we are looking to achieve. And I think of inclusive design as a process, as a method that we use that helps us achieve that outcome of making things accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, you know, the goal of inclusive design is not just to make accessibility as an outcome happen. There's also other goals of, of inclusion and participation and, and belonging and other inclusion related goals that practicing inclusive design helps us with. But one of the most significant outcomes that it does help us with is better understand and better deliver on making things accessible to to everyone. So I, I'll I'll illustrate with a uh, with an example, and and I've done Please some do work. That. I've done some work with with uh, teams that were working on their you know on their website for a podcast, and they produced a podcast, and I had you know, my goal was to, to practice inclusive design to help them along the way. Not only did we want it to be accessible, but I, I told them from the beginning, I really want to include people with disabilities in this process. Um, people with disabilities that aren't me that have different accessibility needs than, than I do that, Mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to make sure that they were represented in the process and, and the best way to represent them in the process was not me as, you know, I've been doing accessibility work for 22 years, but I didn't want to represent them in the work and me be their voice. I wanted their voice to be yes. represented in, in the process itself. And so I, we engaged with, uh, a, you know, probably a handful of people with different disabilities during that redesign process. And one of the things that we found for the pod, it was actually for a podcast, and it was really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. On you know the technical side, it's very straightforward to create an accessible website for a podcast. Right, we have mm-hmm. our we have our audio. We know how to make the the web based podcast player, the web based audio player 
keyboard accessible. We can have okay. all of those, all of the buttons and the controls in there. They're well labeled so that a screen reader user can understand what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we know that we need a transcript that represents the content that's in the audio, right? That's sure that's, the same as we do for this podcast, actually. It, it, exactly. Um, one of the things that I found out, and 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 that can be technically accessible, right? We know exactly how to make that technically accessible, and we can do all of that without talking to or working with people with disabilities. When when we engaged with people with disabilities in the process, one of the one of the people taught me something that, and this lesson will never leave me. This is one of the most important lessons I've ever learned. Uh, this uh, young developer is is hard of hearing, mm. and she and I were were working through, and we were actually doing. I think we might have even done the 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 session, the research session through Slack, so that she could type and that I could type, so that it was more accessible and effective for her for communication. Yes, and what I found out from her. And what I learned from her was that, and I, I, I pause here because I still shake my head a little bit because it's so obvious when I look back at it now, but I hadn't really considered it until she mm -hmm. expressed this to me. I always looked at the transcript as an alternative version or another version of the audio. And yes. that if you don't have access to the audio then the you know the the transcript is what you use and she said to me she described a few things that she would love to see in the interface and she said you know what i really want from this from this podcast from this design is to be able to use the audio and the transcript at the same time Mm -hmm. because I'm not completely deaf. I'm, I'm hard of hearing. So it's not that everybody is going to use the audio or the transcript. She actually wanted to use them together yeah. and, and wanted to use them in a way that complemented one another. And, and that to me was, was this moment where I realized that even though we could make things technically accessible, in order for her to use those two things complementary in a complementary way, we needed a specific design that would actually facilitate that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you might see things like in, with that web-based player, as she was scrolling down through the transcript, well, that web-based player was in a static spot on the web page, which meant that it was scrolled way off into the distance and she yeah. couldn't get at it. So if she wanted to listen to something again, or to read something again, or to, to match up where she was, that design wouldn't facilitate that, even though the design technically passed every existing checkpoint that we have from an accessibility perspective, mm -hmm. it still didn't meet her needs. And, and so that design, we would need to do something with that design in order to facilitate that need for her to use those things independently. One, you know, she could have the transcript open in a separate window Right, that would mm -hmm. allow her to control them, control them independently. Yeah, that's or something she would could, have to do herself. Exactly, or we could have it so that the the web-based player, as you're scrolling through the transcript, the web-based player follows and is in the left-hand margin of the of the transcript, so that you can control those two things independently, and that allows you to use them in a complementary way. Yeah, and that for me was 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 part of the value of inclusive design it was something that i learned that i never would have connected in my head and, and i look back now i'm like i understand that intellectually before talking to her but yeah. i hadn't really connected it that way and after talking with her and after seeing her you know trying to manipulate this interface and talking with her about it it became so much more clear to me that that inclusive design isn't just about meeting a technical accessibility standard. It's about actually meeting the accessibility needs of 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 people that 
have a whole variety of needs that we haven't really even started to discover fully yet. Mm-hmm. So for me, that that was like the most critical piece was understanding that, yes, we created a podcast website that was accessible, but we we needed to go beyond that to make it more inclusive, to make sure that it actually worked really well for people with all different kinds of disabilities. And the only way to get that is by actually including people with disabilities in the process. Definitely. And, and when was it, Eric, uh, about, just about? Uh, that was uh, about a year and a half ago, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm, so, uh, I'm uh, besides hosting this show, I'm also an avid uh, podcast consumer, and I'm just thinking about how many websites I visited uh, about podcasts, uh, with podcasts that don't even have a transcript, or if they have, uh, they aren't going to feature any of these features you're talking about now. It's very rare, I think. Um, so it's still a long, uh, a long road ahead of us in that sense. And and that to me is the the beauty of inclusive design, is that when we practice inclusive design and we include people with disabilities in that design process, whether it's through doing you know really straightforward interviews, or whether it's doing an exploratory usability study or a, a summative usability mm-hmm. study, testing a prototype doing a survey, any of that, the more input that we have and the more uh, thoroughly that people with disabilities are represented and can participate in the process, the better the outcome that we that we end up with. Um, and, and that to me is the, yeah. the value, the true value of inclusive design is we actually end up creating designs that are better for everyone But yeah, most true, importantly, we're creating something that meets the needs of, of people with a variety of disabilities. And that that's that's why I turn to, if we focus on practicing inclusive design, there's a very, very good chance that accessibility as an outcome will be well taken care of. Mm-hmm. If we focus on accessibility as the outcome without including people with disabilities, there's a greater chance that we fail to deliver on accessibility as an outcome and and we definitely fail from a from a an inclusion perspective yeah it might uh, hit all check boxes but uh, it won't be um, as inclusive as could, as it could have been exactly and and I've, i've i was writing about this just last week on on twitter i i tend to go off on on threads there and i've been saying this i think since 2005 the checklist, the you know, compliance, the checklist is the starting point, not the end point. Yes. And 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 you know, the end point really needs to be about that that greater that greater understanding of of accessibility of accessibility being part of user experience and mm-hmm. not just a, a compliance item. Yeah, that's something that I really had to learn also earlier in my career. I'm I'm um came from uh, doing some usability engineering to be, uh, becoming a UX researcher later on in my career. And early in my career, I really saw it as a separate topic that I didn't really want to spend too much time on. I thought it was, uh, you know, I thought it was important. Uh, however, uh, I thought, okay, hit the guidelines and uh, uh, hit the check boxes and uh, things will be okay. And it really took me a while to get that greater understanding, also from talking to people that have those uh, specific disabilities to hear their perspective and what they uh, sometimes or sometimes daily even have to struggle with to uh, open up my own perspective that it is an important part of the entire experience even. Yeah, absolutely. I think we all, at some point, we all go on this journey of of growing and understanding. And, and you know, when we think of designing a a product or or creating a website or whatever it is if we're looking at that as like the the checklist is the starting point not the end point yeah. that actually speaks to the way that we as individuals learn about accessibility as well we often learn about it as a as a checklist as a compliance measure as a measure of quality mm-hmm. um, and and here's this list of things that we need to do and 
you know, the, the thing that I love the most about this field is the more that I learn and the more that I know, the more I realize that I don't know. And, and, and that just kind of keeps me going to, to dig in more and to learn more from yeah. people with disabilities about their experiences and, and, and how the things that we are creating could be, you know, could be more accessible, could be more inclusive for them. In that sense, it has some parallels with your uh, previous uh, fields of expertise with, uh, within the natural sciences, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I like to think of it as an, an, there's, a, there's a biological concept which, which has been maybe debunked a little bit or, and people say it's not exactly true. But conceptually, it, it basically says the, the development of an individual often mirrors kind of the development of a species overall. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I, I often like to think of that kind of that micro and that macro you know, those parallels that are there. And again, that from a, you know, biological perspective, some people have actually written against that and said that that's not a thing the way that it was originally conceived of. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I like to think of it from, from that perspective, because it means that if I think of my own learning on accessibility or another individual's learning on accessibility, that journey of real, of realization uh, is quite often going to be very similar to the journey that an organization takes, right? So an yeah. individual's path and the way that they learn and that they they make sense of what they're experiencing often often mirrors and, and parallels the 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 growth of an organization um, and the growth of an entire industry. So it, it, there's some really interesting parallels there. Yeah, interesting. Okay, Derek, um, very interesting uh, concept uh, there. Um, I want to move on a little bit and um, ask you, you, you have a lot of uh, experience, international experience also, in your opinion, what are some of the biggest challenges that, uh, that digital accessibility has to deal with uh, in these days, also regarding uh, uh, governments? Mm. In, in the broadest sense, I, I'll speak you know, not specifically about government to start with. I'll just speak sure. about d digital accessibility more broadly. I, I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that, that we face with accessibility in the industry in general, not the accessibility industry, the web industry, one of the biggest challenges that we face is, is that people underestimate the impact that accessibility barriers have on an individual's day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. They, they underestimate that impact significantly because they don't have, most people don't have experience that they can, that they can relate to. They don't have a disability themselves or they, you know, when people are younger, I was, I was younger. I'm, I'm 50 years old now, but when I was 28, 29, 30 years old, I, I was at a point where I thought I was maybe, um, you know, to a certain extent invincible and, and these things wouldn't impact me. Uh, but as sure. I get older, like my, my eyesight is not anywhere near as good as it used to be. I, I need to wear glasses. I've got my, the fonts all bumped up on my computer at a, at a system wide setting. I, I regularly command plus and, and command minus to, to adjust the font size of things for me so that I can mm -hmm. read it more readily, depending on the activity. Uh, we, we all age into disability, and I think a lot of people just, you know, don't, don't understand that, or they haven't, for whatever reason, had it impact them or somebody in their lives yet. So they, they don't necessarily recognize that this thing is something that is, um, you know, a, a big part of, you know, close to a quarter of the world's population. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we face is, is people, they're, they're not aware in the first place. And even if they are aware, they often look at it as um, a, a statistic. They, they look at accessibility in the web industry and they think, well, how many people is that? 
mm-hmm. and and they they look at it and they say, well, that's that's less than the number of people that are coming to our site using this browser, and we don't care about that browser. So why, you know, why should we care about people with disabilities? Um, and it's it's. It's just thinking about the uh, about accessibility and in, in kind of in the wrong terms. Um, mm-hmm. When we when we when we are helping someone, we often say, you know, and, and as teachers or as whomever, if I have helped just one person, I've made a difference. Yes, but, but we don't we don't give the same weight to creating barriers for just that one person, mm-hmm. right? We're we're all very proud. Like I helped this one person. I am therefore a good person. I am proud of what I've done. But if we have barriers for one person, we don't give that one person the same weight because it's it's something that we we kind of face that maybe makes us feel guilty or or whatever it is. So, you know, in my mind, the the digital accessibility industry uh, or digital accessibility within the web industry is a thing that people sometimes aren't even aware of haven't thought about. I still have conversations with people where they say, you mean a blind person can use a computer? And, and there, that is still such a foreign, foreign concept for some reason. So I think that's, that's one of the, the biggest challenges that we face is that still lots of awareness related issues. I I think that's changing. I, I see, I I will admit I'm on, I'm on TikTok, and, (laughs) and, I see actually quite a few disabled creators on there. Like there's lots of people with disabilities really? that are creating on TikTok. And I think, you know, one of the things that I'm most excited about is that that, that just um, shows people that are consuming content out there that here's these people with disabilities that are, that are people that are funny, that are creative, that, that, you know, maybe they, you know, they have a, 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 a facial difference or they're missing a limb or they might be blind or, or whatever it is, but they're out there and they're just a person the same as everybody else, right? And that, sure. that's, what, that's what many people with disabilities that I've talked with, they want is they want to just be seen as a person, not as something special. They just want what everybody else, uh, whatever, the same kind of treatment as everybody else. So, you know, I think awareness, awareness continues to grow, but it's sad to say that even here in in 2021, there's still a a severe lack of awareness that is, that is out there for, you know, what accessibility is, why it's important, how we should prioritize it. So the lack of awareness, in your opinion, is one of the larger barriers. It is, it is. The other, the other one is, is a mindset that, that a lot of people with, you know, decision makers in business and in, in organizations, I've even heard of, of scenarios within government where there's pushback about accessibility because the person believes that accessibility is, is not a thing that they need to take into account in that particular situation because it doesn't impact anybody. Well, that's an internal tool and mm. and it's not facing the public therefore it doesn't need to be accessible the 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 reality is that that's changing over time and, and people I mean we should have always had accessible tools within internal tools but when mm-hmm. you think about about opportunities and 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 the ability for a person with a disability to move up to a manager's position or to a manager of managers or a director are the tools that the company has chosen or that the organization has chosen at a, you know, at a, at a kind of a system wide level, are those tools accessible? Yeah. Can, could somebody with a disability have that director's job? Could they be the, the, you know, the senior minister in, in a government department based on the tools that those people need to use? Are the, are they, you know, is there a barrier there just because of the tools that the government has procured? And, and those are some... Um, yeah, go ahead. 
No, I was going to say that like those are the questions that people need to start asking a little bit more. You know, yeah. is, is can people with disabilities be part of the team? Can they can they be on a career path like everybody else is? Or are they in a position where they got hired at this level and they are at that level forever, not because of their ability, not because of their, their intelligence or their skills, but because they can't move up to a higher job simply because the, the tools that are used in that job are not accessible. Yeah, and it's a bit of a chicken and egg uh, story also. If, if, if you could say we don't need, need to make that internal tool accessible because uh, we don't have anyone with a disability, but are you going to hire someone with a disability if you know that you're, they probably can't work with your tools? And if someone does move up or becomes uh, 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 and come, uh, gets a high position within a company, they probably will uh, get those tools because he, will make, uh, he or she will make a fuss about it, uh, uh, rightly so. However, it's uh, it's a shame that uh, that it needs to come to that before a company is going to think about their internal tooling uh, uh, to become more accessible. Yeah, and th- and this this speaks to the the broader issues that that many organizations face, which is how do they embrace, how do they embody, how do they value diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, if definitely. they if you know it, it always connects to that at a at a higher level, and the actions that they take, and the systems that they put in place, need to be aligned with their beliefs and their values on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you know, and, and and maybe, you know, maybe that's the problem is that that people don't believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion are important. It's one thing to put it on your website that you think it's important, but it's another thing to take the action. Of course, it, it's it's the action, and and you know, to me, it's it's like, are we living out the values that we say we have? We say that it's mm. important to us, but you know, and it's it's more than it's more than taking action because I can take all kinds of action and have it be the wrong action. It's that pure alignment between we say this. Do we live it? Do we live it? We say that all citizens should have access to this, regardless of their ability or disability. Mm-hmm. Do we live that? Do we live that in the day-to-day work, in the systems that we put in place, in the software that we procure, in the services that we, that we, that we hire? Do we live it? Do we live it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, uh, Derek. So we spoke uh, 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 quite a bit about the barriers. If we talk about the drivers of accessibility, we, earlier in the conversation we spoke about legislation, an, uh, an important driver probably. Um, any other drivers you care to uh, to mention, to emphasize here? Yeah, this is this is actually my favorite one. Um, you know, the, the driver, we, we kind of talked to this about, a little bit about this in terms of just the, the last... The last little bit about diversity, equity, and inclusion, like that, that sure. for many organizations is a driver. The the one that that I think that gets left out an awful lot that should should be a driver for everyone. If you know, we talk about cre- we want to create great experiences for for people. If we're a government department, we we want to create. Um, great interactions that are that are seamless that feel. Not like a you know massive bureaucracy. They feel easy to use. I can achieve the goals that I need to, uh, you know that I'm that I'm trying to achieve. One of the the things that I think people miss on when they're not practicing inclusive design is there is so much opportunity for innovation and creativity that that ultimately make that service, that product, that whatever it is better. Not just for people with disabilities, but for everyone else. The 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 opportunity for innovation that is there. Yeah, if you look at, I'll I'll go to the um, to the to the private sector for a moment. But if you look at uh, a very recent story, uh, and I'm not sure how publicized this is worldwide, but degree uh, degree makes a deodorant and antiperspirant. Um, that's a you know pretty. I think it's a worldwide brand, but I'm not sure where they are, where 
where they are, but they, they make a, a, an, an antiperspirant and deodorant and they recently sure. created something called degree inclusive and they designed a container for the deodorant. Uh, and I, I would encourage everybody that's, that's listening on the podcast to just go and, and check that out degree inclusive. And you can include it in the show notes. Uh, also. Perfect. I'll look it up. Perfect. They, they went through a process where they, consulted with and worked with many people with disabilities that want to be active, but maybe sometimes, again, it's, it's weird to talk about this, but they, they maybe don't have the confidence to work out or to be active and fit because for whatever reason, they may not be able to, to, to use deodorant. And so they're not as active and healthy and fit as they, as they could be. Um, oh. and, and this, this came across my, it kind of came across my desk because I'm always looking for these these companies that are innovating, and so they created a, a a container that is easy to use by someone that has um, you know the use of only one hand or maybe mm-hmm. no hands, um, and and they made it so that it was easy to use for somebody that can't see. They made it so and so the getting the lid on and off is just as one example. They they have little magnetic uh, closures on the lid so that it's easy to automatically align. You don't have to get it exactly where it is. It will kind of snap into place. So it's easy to close. It's easy to open. Um, and that can be, you know, that can be really useful for, for people with all kinds of different disabilities. They looked at it as an opportunity to, to work with people with disabilities as an opportunity to innovate and to do something that nobody had done before. They, they went through and created over 200 prototypes and eventually wow. ended with a, a deodorant that, that they are super proud of uh, and is actually, you know, changes in some kind of meaningful way um, the, the fitness experience and the, that experience for people with different disabilities. So I would, I would uh, encourage... I would encourage everybody to go and just read about it, learn about it because it's an example of what most orgs are missing is that if we practice inclusion, if we practice inclusive design, the opportunities for innovation are, are massive and, and underutilized. And, and so it's, it's a, a really great story. And I, I think that's probably the thing that I would encourage people to do the most is to go, go and look at that. It's the thing that excites me the most about including people with disabilities in the process. Wow, that's a great example, Derek. Yeah, I'm not familiar with uh, with the story myself, but I'll definitely uh, seek something out and uh, make sure it gets included in the show notes for all the listeners to check it out also. Cool. Um, you know, Derek, I want to talk about your position also a little bit. You're a chief experience officer. Uh, yes. that's a position yeah. uh, that you don't, if you look at uh, the, the C level the, or the executive level, that's not a position you see for every uh, company, um, more often not than, uh, than it is uh, there. You, I, could, I, I think I would dare to say, especially also in the Netherlands, uh, you don't always uh, see that. Um, why do you think it's important for companies to uh, include such a position and what, what difference does it make uh, in your opinion? Yeah, I'll I'll give you two answers. I think the first answer is, you know, I I I specifically chose that title because I wanted to send a message to our own company, but also to all the companies and organizations that we work with that accessibility needs to be part of user experience. That it is not mm-hmm. something that is just about quality assurance testing, and it's not just part of IT or, or the development side of things. It's actually part mm-hmm. of user experience. At least part of it needs to be. So part of my choosing that title was that, that that's a message that I think is really important for everybody to hear. The, the, in, in the broader context, having a chief experience officer at an organization, whether it's a, whether it's a company or you know, what, whatever it is, that connection to people that are actually using the things that we are creating 
mm-hmm. is a, it's, it's really important to have that mindset. And so if accessibility and customer experience rolls up underneath a, a chief experience officer, mm-hmm. that, that is basically a way for a company to say, we believe in the, in ensuring that we are putting people first in this, that we are putting the user first and that their experiences actually matter, that this is not just a, a technology company. This is a company that values experience, that values user experience, customer experience, client experience, whatever it is. And, and that to me is, is probably one of the most important reasons to include it, uh, at, at the executive level. It's somebody that is diligently, constantly advocating for the customer or for yes, the person yeah. that is, is consuming what we're creating. And do you think the fact that you came from your um, background with, with, with your reputation, choosing that title of CXO, um, that, that, that adds that usability, or no, um, I should say usability, that accessibility flair to the CXO position? I, I hope so. I mean, that's that was the intent, and that's my my hope that it that it inspires other people to, or or, or doesn't inspire them, but but forces them to think about where accessibility should live within the organization, right? That that there does need to be that that mindset that this should be part of experience, mm-hmm. uh, overall. So. So for another organization who perhaps, uh, if they uh, want to hire or or select a CXO, uh, it could be someone that doesn't have that extensive experience in accessibility. Um, How about a separate chief accessibility officer? Is that something that you think uh, could be needed in some places? Yeah, and we we actually have a chief accessibility officer at Level Access, and there are lots Mm. of organizations out there that are at the point where they they have senior level leadership at the C-level uh, executive suite that that include a chief accessibility officer, uh, and and so that you know that that to me is is somebody that you partner with. So a, a chief experience officer would partner with the chief accessibility officer, where the accessibility the the chief accessibility officer might be in charge of and ultimately. Um, in, in charge of the the compliance aspect of accessibility mm-hmm. and the execution of it and that that the you know how do we do the work how do we do accessibility work at this organization whereas the chief experience officer would work with them to help the teams understand that this isn't just about that technical side there is this this user experience side as well and so while the the engineering and the development and the testing aspects of of accessibility and inclusion work might roll up under the chief accessibility officer, mm-hmm. the research and the design components can easily roll up under the chief experience officer. So having them work as as partners uh, when when you can get to that type of a scenario uh, would be would be ideal. Yeah, so in that sense, uh, the, the position you're at now at your company, it's quite, um, I would imagine, uh, in many ways, a comfortable position having uh, two professionals on that uh, executive level, on the C level. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Sounds great. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Derek. So, Derek, we're nearing the, the end of our uh, of our conversation, of the episode. Um this is a, a Dutch podcast in an in English uh, version uh, for this episode. Uh, uh, but I'm still curious if I ask you for either a tip or a message for the Dutch government or our Dutch listeners, is there something that you would like to share with them? Yeah, I think the, 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 the tip that I give to most people these days, because people tell me all the time they want to learn more about accessibility. They want to learn more. They want to take action. What should they do? Um, I recommend that they always go and talk with, work with, engage with, and include people with disabilities in some way. If if you yeah. do nothing else, go and do that because that that helps you understand. It gives you new perspective. It gives you a different mindset. 
Um, even if you are doing accessibility work that is strictly at the compliance level, right? Mm -hmm. You're not at the point yet where you can make it more part of user experience. Even at that compliance level, talking with people with disabilities, working with people with disabilities and actually engaging them in the process is one of the most valuable things that, that you can do. Uh, we had, a, as part of leading up to our Accessible Canada Act, uh, we had a bunch of, a bunch of uh, public consultations and presentations from our you know, government officials that were involved. And uh, the, the statement that you hear very often in the accessibility or the disability world is nothing about us without us. And one of our senior level government officials, uh, the Honorable Carla Qualtro, mm -hmm. she has a disability herself. And as part of this, she said, we need to drop the about us. It should just say nothing without us. Because if we're truly involved, people with disabilities are truly involved, it can't be about them. It's literally just you're either doing it without them or you're not doing it without them. So nothing without us is kind of a next evolution of that, that very famous quote and, and saying. And I think that is a great way to approach things. So be, wow, be mindful powerful. of that and think of it that way. Very powerful stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That really, uh, that really got me a little bit. It's, it's, yeah, it's an important way to, to think about it that way. So, um, we have, we, we've been having this conversation. I've been, uh, uh, listening to your answers and I've, I want to, uh, I like to, uh, at the end of the show, um, summarize some takeaways for the listeners. So uh, one thing I heard you say is a uh, checklist is a starting point, not an end point. Um, another thing that I thought was very important to note, uh, people, even if they are aware, people still underestimate, underestimate the impact if something isn't accessible for people on a, on, on a, on a daily basis. And um, a lack of awareness is actually a large barrier. Important drivers are legislation, legislation and uh, organizations wanted to be inclusive, but one that according to you is overlooked is actually the, the innovation and creativity that can come from uh, making things accessible, making uh, services digital accessible, but also making products, uh, physical products accessible. And even if something is accessible according to the, according to the guidelines, it still might not need the, all the needs of someone with a, a disability. And that's why it's so important to include people with disabilities. And yeah, the tip uh, we had just ended on, work with, talk with, engage with people with disabilities, no matter what level you are at. Um, even if you, if that's the only thing you can do, just do that then. And to end on uh, the evolution from nothing about us without us to just without us um, is something important to, to mention again, I think. So, um, Derek, this includes uh, uh, our conversation. This includes my conversation with Derek Featherstone, the Chief Experience Officer at Level Access. Derek, is there something you would like to uh, plug that you would like to uh, uh, forward our listeners to? Yeah, I just encourage you if you if you've enjoyed this and and want to talk more uh, or or follow along with the things that I'm writing and thinking, uh, you can catch me mostly on on LinkedIn and Twitter. So I am at Feather on Twitter. I am Derek mm -hmm. Featherstone on LinkedIn. Uh, I write lots of things there and and share. Uh, share things pretty regularly, so would would love to connect with you there, and uh, yeah, just that's that is the literally the best place to to find me is is both on Twitter and LinkedIn. Yeah, I'll make sure those also get in the show notes so people can just uh, tap or click along. Excellent, Derek. I would like to uh, offer my sincere thanks for your time and insight and expertise. Uh, thanks a lot, and thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun and uh, love, love sharing, love teaching. So great to have another opportunity. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. Are you interested in more interesting conversations like this one? Subscribe to this podcast through Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or in your podcast app of choice. If you subscribe, it'll be easy to listen to a new episode. 
It's also very helpful if you leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Does this episode contain something important for your organization? Share this episode with your colleague, manager, or product owner. Do you want to learn more about digital accessibility? Visit gebruikercentraal.nl slash about dash us or digitoegankelijk.nl. You can also find these links in the show notes. For international listeners, most of the content in this podcast feed and on these websites are in Dutch. Though Gebruikers Centraal, a.k.a. User Needs First, often invites international speakers. Thus, they have quite a bit of content in English on their website. Dear listeners, in these times when there is so much going on, I sometimes feel like I cannot have an effect on anything. During these moments, I like to remember myself what the 13th century Persian philosopher and poet Muhammad Jalal al-Din Balki Rumi has written. Yesterday, I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today, I am wise, so I am changing myself. Dear listeners, until the next one.